Um, can everyone hear me at the back? Excellent. My name is Michelle Hu. Um, I've been a neurology consultant looking after people with Parkinson's for 10 years, but actually been involved in looking after people with Parkinson's probably for 20 years of my neurology career now. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today to our annual open day. Um, we are very passionate about involving people with Parkinson's and their families in all that we do here in the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre. <laughs> And today really is a double celebration. Um, firstly, we've been allowed to announce that we have successfully applied for the renewal for another five years of funding for the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre. And this was launched last week. Um, a little bit of news coverage as well, both nationally and, uh, nationally and locally. And secondly, I'm delighted to announce that because of all the hard work of everybody here, we've now recruited 1,500 people to our research and over 1,005 people with early Parkinson's to the cohort. So this is a wonderful opportunity now to just recap um, over what we've been doing in the last four to five years with your help and really to just summarise some of the findings that we're already starting to publish and work with other scientists and researchers to start to translate into meaningful treatments and better improvements for people living with Parkinson's. So just to start as an introduction with a brief outline of what the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre is, it is, I think, internationally leading, but also very unique because it brings together many different scientists around a table with a Parkinson's clinician who looks after people in the clinic, with a very basic scientist and someone else who's a statistician. So it is one of the very unique things about the opportunity and the environment in Oxford is it promotes this truly interdisciplinary translational research. And our vision is to identify the earliest changes in the pathways leading to Parkinson's that will ultimately allow the development of better treatments, but also to facilitate earlier diagnosis. And what patients ask for when they're first given a diagnosis of Parkinson's in the clinic is what, is, what am I going to be like in the next five years? In 10 years, am I going to be in a wheelchair? So I also um, want the cohort to not just develop better ways to diagnose Parkinson's earlier, but also to give a better idea of the future uh, for each individual when they're just diagnosed so that we can, what we call, prognosticate someone and give them a better idea in their family of how to plan. So there are three interlapping research themes with what we do. First and foremost, starting with the patient, uh, a collection of patients with Parkinson's is a cohort and this is a longitudinal cohort to develop these biomarkers or tests to facilitate earlier diagnosis, earlier treatment and a better idea of the future. And the second theme is developing better models of Parkinson's in a dish and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're starting to do that through our skin biopsy program and Richard Wade Martin who leads the OPDC with me will be finishing the talk this afternoon with some more concrete evidence and steps towards that process and lastly up to now I think it's fair to say that many of the animal models that have been developed for Parkinson's are not relevant to humans they are toxin based which none of you here will have probably been exposed to at the sort of doses that animals are exposed to and they do not have what we call an age dependent process where the older you are the more likely you are to get Parkinson's so age is still the biggest risk for getting Parkinson's in the UK and Western world and so animal models here in Oxford are being developed that are more relevant that mirror this age related process so that we can get a better handle on the underlying brain pathology that's leading to Parkinson's. So I've talked about this being multidisciplinary and this just gives you an idea. We have over 12 co-investigators now in OPDC. We have individual theme leaders. We have Richard who leads as overall PI and I have now become co-PI 
And this is a recent photo of us all in our <coughs> presentation or pitch to a, a rigorous external scientific review panel of about 10 different professors from around Europe and America. And you're seeing here various people. So just so you can put names to face, this is Richard Wade Martins, the PI. That's myself. And then we have Professor Chris Ponting and Caleb Weber. And what they do in the MRC genomics unit is to take all the DNA we collect from your blood test and look at genetic risk factors and uh, in, you know, genetic influences that might predict for your future progression when you get Parkinson's and might predict your individual risk of getting it in the first place. Claire Mackay is a psychologist <coughs> based in Fimrib and she leads our imaging program for Parkinson's, which to date has been mainly MRI, but we're now translating into other newer techniques. And then we have um, Professor Bo Paul Bolam and Professor Pete McGill, who lead the animal theme uh, for developing better models of Parkinson's. And we have Laura Parkinin, who with Olaf Ansorger and Claudia, who's going to tell you a little bit more this afternoon, lead the brain pathology, which is the tissue exploration <coughs> of what's going on in Parkinson's brain. But of course, we know that Parkinson's doesn't just affect the brain. It affects other areas of the nervous system in the body including the gut, so you're going to be hearing a little about that from Claudio. And this uh, dapper, <laughs> dashing young man uh, is Professor Yoav Ben Shlomo. And Yoav and I have actually worked together since 1997. And Yoav is one of the leading UK researchers in epidemiology, which looks at population-based study of disease. And Yoav and I set up a tiny pilot study in Milton Keynes, back in 2007, funded, I think, by an £11,000 innovation grant from Parkinson's UK at the time. And it was successful, and it looked at everybody in the community living with Parkinson's and how many of them came to see a specialist. And the result of that study led to us then translating to the Thames Valley from what you have today as the OPDC. So this really just summarises the three interlapping themes of what we do in OPDC, starting with the patient cohort, moving on from a simple skin biopsy that we can take as an outpatient procedure, very low risk. Some of you will probably have had it done here. And what we're then able to do is grow the skin cells into brain neurons over a 24-week period. But not just that, the ones shown in green are the dopaminergic brain neurons that die early in Parkinson's. When you lose 70% of those, you're not producing enough dopamine to have normal movement. And the dopamine deficiency leads to tremor, stiffness, slowness. What we're doing with Matapar or Cinemet is simply replacing that in an artificial way, obviously every three or four hours, whereas your brain dopaminergic neurons are releasing it second by second. And then we have the animal model. So it may be that in the next five years, we can move from developing treatments from a model in a dish of cell culture back to testing them on patients. But of course, we may also need information to be tested on animals, or we might need to go from animal to the patient. This is obviously interlapping. And so moving forward now, from our first five years of funding and thinking about what we're going to be doing in the next five years, we're going to be moving from understanding to targeting or treating the pathways. So we're interested in what we call stratification. So in my Parkinson clinic at the John Radcliffe, I'll see 16 people in a day and I'll have one person followed by another who are completely different in their first symptoms of Parkinson's, in the delay from that symptom onset to their diagnosis, and in where they're going to be five years and ten years later. So what regulates or controls that response? Why do some individuals do extremely well with low doses of medication and others do terribly with whatever you give them? What actual genetic influences, what environmental influences predict this stratification? We want to develop better biomarkers for earlier diagnosis. You're going to be hearing later from Michal Rolinsky about the earliest stages of Parkinson's that we currently know about, in particular people with REM sleep behaviour disorder. And we're interested in modelling these stem cells or dopamine neurons in a dish 
along with other of our research <coughs> themes, to start to develop new drug targets, in particular better motor function than levodopa, which is pretty good, but also to look at non-motor function, memory and thought processing, and how to help that. And we're interested in preventing Parkinson's altogether in people at very high risk of converting over the next decade. So I'm just going to um, give you a few slides now on the cohort itself and uh, tell you a little bit about it. So as I mentioned, in 2007, really from a tiny amount <coughs> of money and very humble beginnings, we set up a little pilot study. And from that, we had about... There was a population in Milton Keynes of 250,000 people. And Leslie Catterall, who's here, put your hand up, <laughs> uh, I've worked with since 2007, and she valiantly went into all the GP surgeries in Milton Keynes and got past the receptionists with ethical <laughs> permission. <laughs> and she managed to find everybody in the 27 GP surgeries who, who were on the GP surgery list as having Parkinson's or being on treatment. And then we were able to get further information from hospital records and from interviewing individuals that we identified in this way. And we found actually that 90% of people living with Parkinson's in the community actually do make it up to see a hospital specialist for their Parkinson's or a Parkinson's nurse. What about the 10% that don't make it? Well, they're older they're more disabled and more likely to be in a nursing home. So you can understand why it would be more difficult for them to come to a hospital clinic appointment, and they might be just managed by their GP. But what we then did when I was uh, asked to come on board with the OPDC back in 2009 um, was to take the pilot study of Milton Keynes and then to extend it to a 2.1 million uh, population of the Thames Valley. So this is a logistical, you know, job. <laughs> we're, we're talking about 11 hospital sites and we're due to start another sleep clinic site in addition. And we've extended also to Papworth because of the sleep clinic that's done there. And so, so far we've managed to recruit um, our target of 300 controls. These are largely spouses of people with Parkinson's who've come to the clinic and are interested in getting on board. Can I ask here, has anyone here taken part as a control for our research? Fantastic. So I can see about 50 hands. And, uh, and then we also have, so far, a thousand people with early Parkinson's diagnosed in the last three years. And we're going to continue that recruitment and close it sometime in the next six to nine months. The reason is, as I'll show you, is that we've got a lot of people and we've committed to following them up every 18 months in addition to seeing new. And we've also got what we call an at-risk group who either have uh, a, a higher genetic risk because they're a sibling, a brother or sister of someone with Parkinson's or a twin of somebody with Parkinson's, um, or because they've got this REM sleep behaviour disorder problem. And I would say that actually th this group of people have probably the highest risk, uh, probably between 80 to 90 percent chance of converting to having either Parkinson's or related condition over 10 years. So I would say that this sleep problem is a, is a strongest risk factor that we now know of for Parkinson's. It's stronger than other genetic risk. And so far, we've uh, carried out a baseline 18, 36, and soon to start 54-month visits um, with about uh, only 10% of people either moving away or getting too poorly to come up. And so what we're doing is everybody's seen at baseline, and then people who have Parkinson's or at-risk are seeing every 18 months. And we're now going to extend that to 108 months. So this is really going to be one of the best characterised, longest followed cohort of people in the world with early Parkinson's and those at risk of future Parkinson's. And, I mean, who here has taken part as a Parkinson's person in our research? Fantastic. So loads probably 150. And you'll all have perhaps slightly different experiences of how it went uh, based on the hospital, on how your Parkinson's was on the day, on the team that met you. But it's generally a two to three hour visit. There's a blood test, there's consent, and there's the option to do other tests. And we work very closely with ProBand, 
which is also funded by Parkinson's UK and does a very similar um, protocol to what we do in the Thames Valley and it's led by Donald Grosset in Glasgow. So what we're able to do here from a young onset person with Parkinson's in OPDC is to gather a lot of information, what we call clinical information on motor function. Um, Max Little is going to talk to you about an innovative new technologies that's being developed and applied to the cohort to measure Parkinson's symptoms in a, in a remote and objective way. But we also do your sense of smell. We look at things like constipation, how your mood and memory are. We do MRI brain scans in a subgroup. We take DNA from everybody and we take serum from everybody. So the dry ice boxes immediately freeze the samples and they're taken back to our lab curator, Sam. And we also take skin biopsies. So, so far, I think we've done about 80 skin biopsies in people with Parkinson's. So we're well on the way now to setting up a repository for future research. And we believe very much in partnership with patients and public engagement. And this is just a list of some of the things that we do. But what I would encourage you to do, if you'd like to find out more, is go to our newly revamped website, courtesy of Mel, our administrator sitting in the front row, who's also organised today. There are some brilliant videos of some of you who've taken part, videos um, and some other talks that people in OPDC have given, and lots of things about how you can help and take part or collaborate with our research. So I'm going to just end, really, by summarising what I believe are the five key findings that our cohort so far has delivered that haven't obviously overlapped with some of the other speakers today. So the first is MRI. And this um, data is all in the newsletter, so you'll be able to access the publication that was um, in neurology last year. And what we do know is a standard MRI that many of you may have had in your local hospital is looking for structural changes, and it won't tell if you've got Parkinson's or not, particularly early on. But what we do here is a six-minute functional MRI scan, which is called a resting state. And the advantage is it doesn't need you to do anything apart from not fall asleep in the scanner. So you have to lie with your eyes open and just think happy thoughts. And what, <laughs> what it then does is uh, through a complicated program of analysis called principal independent component analysis is pick out different brain areas of the brain that talk to each other in a functionally cohesive way. And we call these resting state networks. Now, we know that there are already about 25 of these networks described in normal volunteers, and they all have differing function. And what, uh, what we found is when we analysed the data in a cohort of 20 people with early Parkinson's and 20 control subjects without Parkinson's, is that not surprisingly, the basal ganglia network is not functioning well, it's not connecting well, and that that distinguishes early on whether you have Parkinson's or not. And interestingly, if you give somebody with Parkinson's levodopa medication, this abnormal disturbed connectivity improves almost to normal. So we're only seeing these changes if we've scanned you after overnight withdrawal. So you've not had any medication for your Parkinson's that morning. And uh, we then, because it was too good a result to be true, uh, with 90%, went on to, and actually because the reviewers said it was too good to be true when we tried to get it published, <laughs> we then ha went on and scanned a totally independent replication cohort of about another 15 people with early Parkinson's, and we found exactly the same thing. And included in that were people who'd never had medication as well, five of them, I think, shown here in purple. So what we're now doing at Milton Keynes Hospital is trying to translate this into NHS care. And we are now going, with the, with, the, with the very sort of willing help of the Milton Keynes Radiology Department, going to be adding on this MRI six-minute sequence because it's so quick and easy to people already having an MRI structural scan because they may have Parkinson's for a different reason. And we're going to be, I'm going to be taking the images back to Oxford every week when I finish my research clinic for them to be analysed. So this is potentially very exciting. MRI is very low cost and it's low risk. It doesn't involve radiation or intravenous access. So potentially, this might be a very exciting tool. And the second, it was work really done on the baseline cohort um, by Conrad Kolikowski. 
And what he did here was to take the first 650, 700 people with early Parkinson's in our cohort. And what he found was that actually, again, the older you are when you get your Parkinson's, the more likely you are, unfortunately, to do badly, to progress more quickly. Uh, and also, interestingly, he found gender differences where, as a general rule, men are more likely to have upper body Parkinson's with arm involvement in a symmetrical way, but women are more likely to have early involvement of balance and leg function. Um, this may not be your personal experience, but this is trends that we're observing that may be relevant even on an individual level basis. So we now want to obviously see what happens over time and follow up uh, to, to the same people. The third is that sleep matters to how you present with your Parkinson's. And this REM sleep behavior disorder I keep talking about, where people shout, have nightmares, and enact their dream, they might punch or kick their bed partner or fall out of bed. We found 50% of people with early Parkinson's have REM sleep behavior disorder when you do it, when you assess for it in a simple questionnaire. And that affects how your Parkinson's is. You're more likely, if you have early REM sleep behavior disorder, to be more sleepy in the day and to have more problems with your mood or memory. So this is very important to know because it may mean that you might be treated in a different way and particularly medications that make you more drowsy could be avoided for people with REM sleep behavior disorder early on. The fourth was work um, again on the early cohort, roughly from about the first 400 people that is really trying to look for early memory problems, which for many patients and their families is a big issue with day-to-day -day living and function. And we're interested in pragmatic tests that are most sensitive to early change. And what we did here was compare the mini mental state examination with a different <coughs> test called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. We do both of these in part of in the cohort. You'll remember things like counting backwards from 100, taking away threes, um, you know, how are an apple and an orange similar, that kind of thing. And what we found is that the Montreal Cognitive Assessment is much more sensitive in early Parkinson's than these more standard tests like the MMSE that have been around for much longer. And they both take the same time to, to administer, about 10 or 15 minutes. So these are very quick, easy tests that actually a GP could be doing before referring on, say, to a memory clinic or a hospital appointment for assessment. And lastly, I, I, what, what was very interesting to me was looking at patient clusters. And this is to do with how you present early on. And um, what we did was to say, well, we've got all this information in um, 800, 700 people. If we take all the information that we've collected in an unbiased way and give it to Yoav in Bristol, can he apply complicated statistical modeling in an unbiased way to pick out different groups or clusters of people? And this really just shows you some of the information. People are generally, when they take part, about <laughs> six, 65 years of age. They've had Parkinson's um, about 1.3 years from diagnosis, although there's a range. And they have relatively mild um, motor disease scores. And about 12% are not on treatment when they first come to our research visit. And so what, what you have to do for this um, uh, clustering technique is to try and pick out what are the main factors that are responsible for driving the differences from one individual to another. And we found three main factors. The first is what we call psychological well-being. And these are measures of depression or anxiety, fatigue, pain, and apathy, really important for some people with early Parkinson's. The second factor are what we call non-tremor motor symptoms. And these are things like your speech, your rigidity due to your Parkinson's, your slowness of movement or bradykinesia, <laughs> and postural, so how well you respond to being pulled backwards or walk around. And these more objective measures of gait and the third are memory, cognitive, so easy bedside tests I've talked about. And what we then did was to take these three factors and say, right, each individual sitting here who has Parkinson's will have a sum score on each of these factors. But does that mean then that we can put each individual into one of these groups using this factor analysis? And we did. We found five clusters, <laughs> which have gone. <laughs> The video, the picture's gone. Never mind. All right, so just <laughs> to summarise the clusters, um, we had this lovely 
PDF file, but never mind. I think we can, it'll be online on our website because it's just been accepted for publication shortly. So we found five main groups. The first, ha making up 25% of everybody in the cohort, have milder Parkinson's. So they have, they're younger, uh, and they tend to have less motor and non-motor disease. The second group, 23%, they have much worse performance on memory testing and also balance and posture. The third group are what we call tremor dominant. And we've known about this group of people with Parkinson's for years because often having a tremor means it's a more visible symptom of your Parkinson's. But time and again, I, I follow people up with tremor dominant Parkinson's who actually do extremely well, even 10 or 15 years from their diagnosis. So we did find this tremor dominant group who actually, apart from their tremor, were very well. So they didn't have any of the memory or the mood or the balance or the stiffness issues. Then we had a fourth group, 20%, who did very poorly on sleep measures and REM sleep <coughs> behaviour disorder, and also had worse function on mood, depression, anxiety, so more prone to that. And then the last group, 12%, did really badly across all of the measures, and they also had really poor you know, measures of depression and anxiety, probably because their Parkinson's is so <coughs> severe. So I guess really what this has been very helpful for me to think about is that if you're doing an interventional drug study on a thousand people with Parkinson's and you're not trying to subgroup them into these different clusters, you may, even if the drug only worked on one group, you would have a negative overall result and you would miss that because you're not appreciating the individual differences. So what we now need to do is see whether we can replicate these findings in the tracking cohort, and see, remember, this is just based on a baseline time point. So what happens 18, 36 months? Do people move from one cluster to another? Does your baseline cluster predict where you're going to be five to 10 years from now? <coughs> so this really just summarizes some of the publications that I've mentioned that are all available on the new, well, most of them are available on the new website. So. Just to finish, to summarise, where do I think the future is for people with Parkinson's? I think earlier diagnosis in what we call the premotor phase, before the tremor or the stiffness is manifest, is one of the best chances of us of giving a cure for Parkinson's. And this particularly, I think, applies to people with REM sleep behaviour disorder here. <coughs> and one of the patients here today actually presented with vivid dream enactment, and I saw him, and a year later he developed Parkinson's. We do need individually tailored treatments that take into account how one person from another may progress or respond to medication. And this is becoming possible as we have technology to help to better understand Parkinson's. And ultimately, better monitoring of the symptoms should enable better symptomatic treatments. Really moving forward, we need to become more collaborative. And we have now developed on our website a whole section of application forms if other scientists and centres want to collaborate with us. And we have a process that we're just about to start next month to do that. And I'd like to end by really just thanking all of the people who've helped to make the research a success. Firstly, the patients. Secondly, our Dendron research nurse team, all the clinical fellows, Sam Avets in the lab who takes all the samples, Claire Mackay in the MRI uh, scanner, Yoav Ben Shlomo and Michael Lawton in Bristol, and also the team of neuropathologists and basic scientists. So thank you very much.